so today we are going to revise the wave theory of light in our previous lecture we revised the geometric optics or the ray optics okay so what is the main distinctive feature between the wave theory and the or the wave optics and the geometric optics in geometric optics in geometric optics the wavelength of light so it is still a wave but we use an approximation there so in geometric optics we say that the wavelength of the light is very small compared to the size of the object and therefore we don't uh, see the deviation that takes place in the direction of light so we can assume that light travels in a straight line when it comes to ray optics or sorry wave optics first of all there are some phenomena which the geometric optics cannot explain like the interference the diffraction and the polarization so we have to assume that light is a wave and maxwell's theory tells us that light is a transverse electromagnetic wave okay so in wave optics in particular the diffraction phenomenon we get to see that when the wavelength of light is of the same order of the size of the object then light bends or light changes it deviates from its rectilinear propagation okay so we are going to study a revised wave optics now beginning with the huygens principle so what does what did huygens tell first of all huygens uh, during his time electromagnetic waves okay were not known so huygens assumed that light is a a light is a longitudinal wave he assumed that light is a longitudinal wave but he was wrong okay light is a light is a transverse wave number 2 Huygens also assumed that there exist or because longitudinal waves require a medium for the propagation for their propagation uh, Huygens assumed or everybody during his time in the scientific community they were convinced that there exists a medium called ether which is odorless massless we cannot detect it so on and so forth for the propagation of the longitudinal wave light okay so this was also disproved later but the theory of wave fronts and wavelets that he proposed uh, we can explain the reflection and refraction of light and also the fact that frequency does not change but wavelength and uh, velocity or speed of light change when uh, it passes from one medium to the other we can prove them using the huygens principle okay so what exactly is a wave front what exactly is a wave front wave front is a set of points set of points having the same state of oscillation all the time having the same state of oscillation and depending on the geometry or the size of the source we get uh, wave wave fronts of different shapes okay so wave fronts are essentially surfaces wave fronts are essentially surfaces okay so if you have a point source then the wave front will be spherical if you have a cylindrical uh, source then the wave like a slit then the wave fronts are cylindrical sorry if you have a linear source then the wave fronts are cylindrical and if you consider wave fronts emitted by either a point source or a line source uh, at a distance which is uh, very far okay at a location which is very far from the origin of the wave fronts then we may take some portion of it and treat them as planar wave fronts let me again remind you that the concept of uh, wave fronts and the direction of propagation is analogous to okay 
is analogous to what? Equipotential surfaces. Equipotential surfaces and direction of electric field. Just an analogy. They both are also perpendicular to each other. The equipotential surfaces are normal to the direction of electric field. Isn't it? Yes. So why do we need these wavefronts? Because to explain the phenomena of reflection and refraction of light, we are going to consider even there the simplest of them, that is oblique incidence on a flat surface. But still, we will need the ideas of wavefronts and wavelets. Okay. So what exactly is Huygens principle? Huygens principle uh, tells us that every point on any wavefront is going to act as a secondary source of light. We have already seen that secondary sources do not produce light on their own, but they actually uh, well re receive light from some other source and then they spread it everywhere. So the principle tells us that every point on that wavefront is going to act like a secondary source of light sending secondary wavelets in all directions and we also stated that wavelets which travel backwards are uh, ineffective okay the only we need only to consider we only are required to consider the wavelets traveling in the forward direction okay so let us uh, see now the Huygens principle formally each point on a wavefront acts as a secondary source of light emitting secondary waves called wavelets in all directions which travel with the speed of light in the medium. So the the speed of propagation of wave fronts is the same as the speed of propagation of wavelets which is equal to speed of light in that medium. Second point, the new wavefront can be obtained by taking the envelope of the secondary wavelets uh, traveling in the forward direction and is thus the envelope of the secondary wavelets in the forward direction. Okay, so this is the new wavefront. Okay, new wavefront. So let us, uh, let me now explain quickly how to apply Huygens principle for a traveling wavefront which is planar wavefront. Okay, so suppose this is a planar wavefront, let us say at uh, t equal to 0, okay, at t equal to 0. Now suppose we allow uh, the time, the tau, uh, well tau units of time to pass. So during during that particular uh, interval of time, every point on the planar wavefront is going to act like a secondary source of light. And how are we going to calculate the radius of the wavefront? The radius will be V tau. Why is it V tau? Because V is the speed of light in that medium. and tau is the time. So the distance which the wavefronts travel during time tau will be v tau. So let me now draw two such wavelets. Okay, now I can uh, erase the backward traveling wavelets. Okay, and then that will give me So if I draw an envelope of these, I've drawn only two of them. And if I draw an envelope of these, then I will get the direction of the new wavefront. Okay, so this will be our new wavefront. Or the, the wavefront after time t equal to tau. And this is the speed. Uh, this is the direction of propagation of light. So have you understood this Huygens principle and this is called as Huygens construction actually and we uh, employ this in proving the laws of reflection and refraction. Is that clear? Uh, let me also uh, tell you that uh, there exists a similar figure in the textbook where they talk about uh, a spherical wavefront not a planar wavefront but the situation is similar. Okay. Now. I'm not going to prove the laws of reflection here by Huygens principle, but I would like to make a few points here. First of all, uh, 
both the reflection and refraction laws when you wish to prove them by Huygens principle okay you basically make use of geometry so essentially these proofs of laws are geometrical constructions when it comes to the proving or when it comes to proving uh, laws of reflection then we need to make use of congruence of triangles okay then we need to make use of congruence of triangles but let me sketch the outline of the uh, of the of the proof okay the main law that is angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection so ab is our incident wave front and we consider an oblique incidence oblique incidence means what the angle of incidence will not be zero okay oblique incidence refers to or implies that angle of incidence will not be equal to zero okay will not be equal to zero so the idea is uh, so we have this plane wave front ab the idea is that at the moment where a reaches the reflecting surface mn the other side of the wave front that is b is yet to reach the reflecting surface so during that time the point a is going to act as a secondary source of light and it is going to send wavelets in the same medium because this is now the direction of propagation and as per the principle we are not going to we are not going to consider the backward traveling wave fronts so what does ae represent ae represents the distance traveled by the secondary wavelet or its radius after time t equal to tau and what is this what is happening during this time during this time point p is reaching point c so suppose bc is v tau ae will also be equal to v tau okay ae will also be equal to v tau so that circular arc that you see here is going to be your uh reflected uh, the the wavelet i would say the wavelet whose radius is uh, v tau and whose, whose center is a now by this logic of enveloping the wavelets if we now imagine that moment where uh, the radius of the secondary wavelet emitted by a is v tau okay what will be the radius of the secondary wavelet emitted by c it will be zero why will it be zero because it has just reached that it has just reached m so if we want to draw an envelope we can just draw a line originating from c and tangential to this circular arc so that is uh, the ce itself is now the tangent c is tangent to arc ae okay so this ce will now be our reflected wave front ce will now be our reflected wave front and then you have to use geometry and uh, i have told you this fact many times angle between any two lines or planes is angle between their normals and that's why this angle of incidence becomes equal to this and when this is the angle of deflection okay this is the angle of deflection and then you have to can prove the equality or congruence rather you can prove the congruence of triangles abc and aec and that proves the laws of deflection okay you can go through our uh, regular uh, lecture notes to to get the complete proof of laws of reflection okay now let us go to <coughs> laws of refraction <coughs> by huygens principle so even here we will make use of geometry but we don't use similarity here rather in proving the laws what do we make use of we make use of right triangle trigonometry okay we make use of right triangle trigonometry <coughs> we have we need to consider two triangles which sharing which share 
common hypotenuse okay which share common hypotenuse and what hypotenuse is that according to the figure it is hypotenuse ac correct ab is the direction of the ab is the incident wavefront which is again at an oblique incidence okay angle of incidence not equal to 0 that is oblique incidence and we are assuming that the medium one in medium one this the speed of propagation of light is v1 so by the time b reaches the interface pp prime a will act as a secondary source of light and because we are studying refraction we are going to consider the wavelets traveling in this direction okay now the time is tau okay after tau after t equal to tau b reaches c okay and the distance traveled will be v1 tau the distance traveled will be v1 tau okay but then what happens to uh, the secondary wavelet at a secondary wavelet at a expands to r equal to v2 tau because we are assuming that the speed of light there is not the same because of course the media are different again by applying the logic which we applied in the reflection laws we have to draw a tangent ce and that is going to give us the refracted wave and then you can consider the triangles aec and triangles abc okay can anybody tell me why is angle abc 90 and why is also angle aec 90 Why are we taking those? Why are we taking the right triangles there? Who guarantees that ABC is the right angle? And AEC is the right angle? Currently, uh, AB is a wave front and so ray of light. Hai. Yes, it's, it's this. So, right, very good. Direction of propagation and uh, the plane of wave fronts, they are perpendicular to each other always. Yes, correct. Okay, so you have to consider the common side, common hypotenuse, so that proves the, the snail's law, n1 sin r is equal to n2 sin r, using Huygens principle. Alright, then you can also uh, remember these figures. What happens when light undergoes a refraction by a thin prism, a convex lens, and a concave mirror? These are figures given in the textbook. When light passes through a thin prism, the wave front does not change its shape. Okay, but the light bends in, uh, in its direction. So, planar wave front remains a planar wave front post refraction. But uh, when well, you can explain the the uh, the oblique thing why it emerges out oblique okay it, it, it's related to the thickness of the prism at these two locations okay next what happens when an incident plane wave uh, uh, well faces a convex or converging lens a convex or converging lens we know through ray optics that it, the rays are going to converge to the focus and through that we can easily predict the direction or the shape of the refracted wave it is going to be a spherical wave fit, radius f and what about concave mirror well again in the case of a concave mirror when a planar wave front is incident on a concave mirror all the rays will be again focusing or passing through the focus of that mirror correct so again the wave front will be spherical and because for mirrors, spherical mirrors, radius is half of the radius of curvature, it will be r by 2. Okay. Fine. Then let's talk about polarization quickly. First of all, polarization is a wave phenomenon. It is a wave phenomenon. Can anybody tell me whether polarization applies to longitudinal waves can we polarize sound waves yes or no uh, nice. 
no sound waves cannot be polarized so polarization applies only to transverse waves uh, is it because sound waves don't have electromagnetic components no it is, it is because uh, longitudinal waves or sound waves have their uh, direction of oscillation the same as the direction of propagation the blue one is a transverse wave and the orange one is the longitudinal wave both waves the one cycle on the run button can be seen to travel to the right all you want all i want you to observe is uh, observe that okay so first of all i am going to i'm going to ask you to focus on this point here okay i'm going to ask you to focus on this point so it, you will find that this is going to oscillate in a in in in, in along y axis like this okay so wave is propagating towards right but this particle here is going to oscillate vertically upwards downwards upwards downwards upwards downwards from the mean position now again now the next you focus on the okay this particular the leftmost vertical orange segment which signifies the particles of that particular medium a, a layer of them and you can find that this layer is going to oscillate like this about its mean position which confirms that in longitudinal waves the particles oscillate along the direction of propagation so you cannot polarize them otherwise the wave will stop okay look here so first of all you focus on this uh, end of the wave downwards upwards downwards upwards okay so this explains the polarizing ability of transverse waves they can be polarized now what about uh, longitudinal waves no look look at the left one left layer okay the way it the, the way this layer is oscillating the direction it is the same as the direction of propagation to visualize the direction of propagation look at this compression it is traveling towards right or look at this ray faction it is also traveling to the right so the main reason why you cannot polarize longitudinal waves or rather the only reason is that the the two directions are same direction of oscillation and direction of propagation whereas for a transverse wave they are perpendicular to each other okay okay very okay very good so uh, what exactly is polarization in a in unpolarized light in unpolarized light we know now that light consists of well alternating electromagnetic uh, electric and magnetic fields sorry which are mutually perpendicular and they are also perpendicular to the direction of propagation of light okay so if if the light is unpolarized it basically means light can still travel in the same direction but unpolarized means the the planes of vibrations of the electric field okay they are they are not the same it, the, the electric field oscillations can be found in any plane so which is signified by drawing these rays so that you, you know that the electric field is oscillating in all planes that is uncertain and polarized right some materials we call them polarizers they have this ability of selective absorption so they will allow they will allow only those electric fields or waves corresponding to those electric fields to pass through them uh, which are along its polarizing axis everything else will be almost absorbed almost absorbed okay you can see that in this figure while entering look at the horizontal component It, it's the maximum. Its its magnitude is maximum, and then it is shrinking. It is almost zero, right? Okay. So, what are the three important terms? The first term is the particular direction along which the electric field of the emergent wave is oriented is called as pass axis. Okay, is called as pass axis or polarizing axis. Because if the wave, uh, if the if the electric fields are oscillating in that direction. only then or only those things are permitted not not any other direction okay or rather its component along that it's permitted next the plane containing the electric field vectors of the plane polarized light what do you call it you call it the plane of oscillation plane of oscillation or plane of vibration Okay, so does this plane? I have shown you this in our regular lecture. This is the plane of vibration, and the plane perpendicular to that will be called plane of polarization. 
plane of polarization. So this plane of polarization is like a gate. It allows only one component to pass. Okay, so this is called as plane of polarization. What is the important law here? It is the Mallet's law. I will not go through everything now, but I just tell you what happens here, the situation. I is the intensity of the unpolarized light. I is the intensity of unpolarized light. When it is passed, this unpolarized light is passed through a polarizer. The intensity of the emergent wave, okay, we have to average it now, you know the reason. I1 average, which is the intensity of the plane polarized light, it will be half of the original intensity because the average value of cos squared theta over 0 to pi is 1 upon 2. Okay, fine. So, what is Malice law? Malice law tells us that if you now allow this plane polarized light to pass through an analyzer whose uh, polarizing axis makes an angle of theta with the polarizing axis of the first one, first polarizer, then the intensity of the emergent wave will be I1 average times cos squared theta. This is called Malice law. Or it will be I cos squared theta by 2 if I denotes the intensity of the unpolarized light. Correct? Which means if I hold this analyzer in, in, in such an orientation that theta is 90 degrees, then the light will be completely absorbed. No light can emerge out. If you remember the polaroid goggle figure that I showed you the image, you will understand what I am saying. So this is Malice law. You also have Brewster's law, but it has been omitted, so I will not cover it now. Let us now go to interference and superposition. So, superposition principle is a very versatile principle. It applies to electric fields, it applies to magnetic fields, it applies to forces, and it also applies to velocities, it can also apply to waves. Okay, so what does superposition tell us? Superposition tells us that the resulting displacement at any point due to multiple waves will be the vector addition of the individual displacements produced by each wave ignoring the presence or existence of the other waves. This is what is superposition. Correct? Now what is interference? Interference refers to the phenomenon in which two waves overlap and produce interesting patterns which cannot be explained by ray optics. Okay, which cannot be explained by ray optics, so we have to use the wave optics there that refers to interference. What is meant by constructive and destructive interference? Please note, be it a destructive interference or a constructive interference, it is only redistribution of energy. Redistribution of energy, optical energy. So energy is not being destroyed when you see a dark band and energy is not being created when you see a bright band. It is only redistribution of uh, optical energy. So in the case of constructive interference, what happens is the wavefronts that arrive at a point okay, or the waves that arrive at a, at a particular point, they are such that the path difference is an integral multiple of wavelength okay integral multiple of wavelength so they uh, construct uh, they interfere constructively so the peak coincides with peak or and the crest coincides with the crest producing maximum intensity there correct and in the case of a destructive interference the condition is that the path difference okay so here path difference is distance of the source a uh, difference between the distances of the locations from the sources so S1 B minus S2 B is the path difference delta L for point B and S1 C minus S2 C is the path difference for uh, the point C, correct, is the path difference for the point C. 
we can prove this that we can prove this rather I, I, I think we have that whenever the path difference is an integral multiple of lambda that is zero lambda one lambda or negative lambda two lambda or negative two lambda and so on then you get constructive interference and when they differ by an odd multiple of lambda by two an odd multiple of lambda by two or half integral number of wavelengths then you get destructive interference that means crest of one coincides with trough of the other and if the waves have same amplitude okay the waves have same amplitude therefore intensity then you will see total darkness there correct you can see that at this point or any point on the x axis for these two sources which are uh, symmetrically distributed about x axis the x axis will always be a uh, well it, it will always have constructive interference of the waves now the most famous experiment the most famous experiment for interference of light waves is the young's double slit experiment so the setup is something like this you take a monochromatic source of light you let it pass through a very thin slit is not whose uh, thickness is around 1 micrometer and let me remind you that the range of visible uh light wavelength what is that that is 0.4 micrometer to 0.7 micrometer correct this is for visible light in discussing electromagnetic waves i have told you this right visible light so this is of the order of 1 micrometer isn't it this is of the order of 1 micrometer and that's exactly what we are going to see now in young's double slit experiment the wavelengths are comparable with the size or the width of the slits correct so you can see the wave effects interference refraction acha so s not is going to act like a, a line source now it is going to emit cylindrical wavelets and then these wavelets are made to fall on another opaque screen but having two slits s1 and s2 so the s1 and s2 are uh, again of the same dimensions and the distance between them separation distances let's say so some some hundred few hundred micrometers or few tens of micrometers correct and what you see here is alternate dark fringe bright fringe or dark band bright band dark band bright band with the central band being the bright the bright bands refer to locations of constructive interference and the dark bands refer to the existence of or locations of destructive interference the mathematical treatment reveals that the mathematical treatment reveals that the path difference the path difference at any point on the screen which is kept a few meters away from the from the slits okay is directly proportional to the location of the distance of that particular point from the uh, from the center of the screen correct so it is y d by capital d where d is the separation distance between the slits and capital d denotes the separation distance between the slits and the screen so here we use an approximation what approximation do we use the path difference okay we assume that the rays or uh, the yeah the rays that uh, come out of s1 and s2 they are almost parallel to each other so the path difference will actually be equal to d sin theta this one and if if you now consider okay if you now consider the triangular geometry this one the triangular geometry okay if you consider this from the center then you can see that sin theta is approximately equal to uh y by d okay opposite of mod well you have prog well you can now use several approximations here sin theta and tan theta they both are equal to theta so that is how this relation is come okay d sin theta or sin theta is uh 
capital y upon small d correct sin theta has been approximated as y upon capital d so that's the path difference then when you equate this path difference to an integral multiple of lambda n lambda then you will get locations of the bright bands or bright fringes Okay, location of the bright fringes. So the nth bright fringe will be located at a distance of n lambda capital D by D on either side of the center of the screen. This refers to the location of the dark fringes. You may please remember these formula because for your entrance exams this is required. Fringe width. How wide is every fringe? It is lambda capital D by D. and uh, remember that the dark and the bright fringes they both have the same width ignoring the thickness of slits s2 and s1 we have said earlier that they are one or uh, well one micrometer wide if you consider that then we have to also incorporate the diffraction effects which we are going to discuss now and last one is the phase difference phase difference if phase difference is a multiple of 2 pi then uh, constructive interference okay so delta phi is the phase difference uh, k is the wave vector or wave number it is the reciprocal of the wavelength of light into 2 pi okay that is delta phi equal to k times delta then last part we know that intensity of any wave intensity of any wave is directly proportional to square of the amplitude of the wave amplitude refers to maximum displacement or maximum value of the electric field for electromagnetic waves so if you have uh, if you are looking for the maximum intensity in the interference pattern it will be directly proportional to the addition of the yeah individual amplitudes squared so e not refers to amplitude of electric field okay and the subscripts one and two refer to uh, i mean if if at all you have waves of different intensities then e not one and e not two may not be the same but otherwise if they are same then it will be 4 e square if the intensity is the same and for minimum you have to take the difference and mod of course and if again now you see if it, if the intensities are same Okay, if the amplitudes are same, then I mean will be zero. You will get to see total darkness. Okay, now let's go to diffraction. What is the idea behind diffraction? We will start with a single slit diffraction. The idea behind diffraction is that if you take a very tiny slit of the order of a micrometer width, you expect that according to ray optics, you expect a uh, you can say it's bright shadow here and everything else will be dark but you don't see that instead you see a central bright fringe okay and follow which follow uh, followed by alternate dark and bright fringes but there is a difference here in interference we say that the fringes are of equal intensity that means all bright fringes have same intensity but here that doesn't happen okay the central fringe or the central band is the brightest and the other ones are very very faint okay very faint and uh, you can see that even in the case of intensity and the numbers almost 85% of the incident beam intensity is concentrated at the central bright band and the width is inversely proportional to the slit width which width this width that means uh smaller the slit width larger the width of the central bright band correct that is the conceptual idea of diffraction so here we have to consider okay i just to give you an idea in young's double slit experiment in young's double slit experiment we ignore the thickness of the slits thickness or width of the slits 
they are ignored there so we assume we assume that then light waves from two different sources interfere okay we we assume that s2 uh, uh, the waves that come out of s2 they cannot interfere with each other okay but in diffraction we have to assume that or that's what we see here otherwise we cannot explain it and in diffraction we consider that okay which also uh, tells us that interference and diffraction are conceptually the same presence of multiple waves at the same time at the same location but the difference is in diffraction we can say that it is interference of infinitely many light waves okay and for a diffraction uh, for interference well only two or three comfortably finite acha this is the graph of the intensities okay this is the slit width a and you can see that the central fringe is the brightest i not if now if i if i assume that its intensity is i not then the first bright band on either side has intensity of 0.0472 into i not so it is lesser than 5% of what it is here and if you go further on either sides then the intensities of the bright bands they drastically decrease so this is less than 2% this is less than 1% okay 